Hi Russell, welcome to the Reading Fabricator and today I'm going to talk to you about a very tremendous book indeed. One that really, really pushes back as much as it gives. And that is Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. Just a fascinating, bizarre, weird, dense thing. I mean, it's only 340 pages, but it's so, so thick. There is so much going on, so much packed into this book. I think the last time I read a book less than 400 pages that packed this much of a wallop would have to be Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. So it really does just give off a lot going on and all that sort of thing. Uh, the tale of the Barnuskis, or in some videos I've seen that pronounce the last name as the Binuskis. And it's broken up into two timelines. So the first one involves the what is referred to as the present time in the book. And the second one is the backstory. And the backstory probably takes up about 75 to 80 percent of the whole book, while the present time takes about 15, 20 ish, -ish percent sort of thing. And it all was told from the perspective of a character by the name of Ollie or Olympia, who is a dwarf with a hunchback and is al an albino. She's described as about 36 inches tall, uh, so quite short indeed. And in the present time, she lives with her mother and her daughter in an apartment block, but no one, neither of them know that they're related to one another. The mother is pretty much off her mind after everything that's happened uh, in the past, and the daughter was given away after Olympia gave birth to her for reasons that will become explained later in the video. Uh, so none of them know that they're related to each other. But it, det it details pretty much the mother trying to get to know the daughter. And um, by doing so, she pretty much reevaluates her past and she talks about what goes on in the past. So the book opens with the mother and the father, uh, Crystal, Lil and Al, who are relatively normal people. And they, I can't remember if they run the carny or if they just work there. I'm, I'm going to go off run. So they run this, this carnival, this show, and it's fallen on hard times. It's not making enough money. And so how they meet is the geek, and a geek is someone who performs a disturbing act, uh, usually eat, uh, chewing off a chicken's head and then swallowing it. The geek for their show proclaims that the, his father is ill, and so he has to go run the brokerage for his family back over in another state so crystal lil or just lil by lil she goes by lil um she offers to be the geek and she gets in the pen and just bites off a chicken's head and that's pretty much how al and lil meet is through this act and they come up with a plan they're going to purposely have children but during the pregnancy they're going to expose Lil to all these different things like radiation and different insecticides and just all sorts of chemicals in the hopes of giving birth to what they what they deem to be freaks to be ab abnormal humans with defects the first uh, child the eldest is Arturo or Artie and he has been described as someone who has a human head and torso but has pretty much flippers for hair legs and uh, legs and arms the second uh, child is Ollie Olympia the one I described previously the third one uh, is the Siamese twins um, Effie uh, sorry Ellie and Iffy and they're described as being two separate humans so they have forearms and all that sort of thing down to the waist when it becomes a whole person. So it's two separate beings and it then morphs into one. So that's how it is. And then the final kid is uh, Fortunato. And when he's when he's born, he is completely normal looking. And they're actually taught their whole story involves the family traveling around this town in the early hours of the morning, trying to get rid of this baby dump it because it was it wasn't. Uh, to their mind a perfect being it was just a normal human being but as they're about to dump this baby it pretty much through telekinesis rips off the Lil's uh, top and begins to breastfeed itself and that's when they find out the kid is while, while normal looking actually has probably the most powerful deformity out of all of them and thus they find out it has telekinesis and those are the kids and as the book progresses 
it becomes less about the parents and more about the kids. The parents sort of disappear into the background, especially in the latter half of the book when the whole cult thing happens. Now, Arturo, or Artie as he prefers to be called, is... Um, He's been described as being a megalomaniac. He's a sociopath. He doesn't care about a thing. And all he cares about is being the top act at the show. He cares about selling our tickets. He, uh, he goes on and on about whether or not he, he's sold more tickets to his act than the Siamese Twins has. And he always talks to Ollie, who works as the ticket taker, whether or not he, uh, she sold more tickets to his show or their show. Now, there's also more kids that were born, but... Some died through childbirth and others died uh, early in their lives and they're, they're preserved in jars in, I think it's formaldehyde. And the, the, the descriptions of some of these kids that are put in the jars is absolutely horrific. The one I remember is the one which is two heads, one at the normal side of the body and one at the spinal bottom part. And it sounds absolutely horrific, but I think that was the one that died early on in its life. And it's hinted at that Arturo killed him. Uh, because he, he he wants to be the most perfect ab, abnormal in the whole family. He doesn't want anyone taking his thunder. And it, it's hinted at because he tries to kill um, Fortunato, the chi or Chick, as he is called, the, the, layer, the earliest child, the newest child, the one with telekinesis, because during a, there's a time where they walk in on uh, him trying to kill him, and Olympia uh, takes the... Um, Basically, she pretty much stands up for him and says, no, 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 he wasn't, he wasn't trying to kill him sort of thing. So there's this whole thing going on where Olympia loves for Arturo. And Arturo has a thing for, I think, Ify, but Ellie doesn't like Arturo. So there's a whole lot of family dynamics going on. And how it builds is, well, I was a bit concerned because for the first half of the novel, it just feels like it's going on like this. You know, they go to separate towns and, you know, it's just act after act after act. And I thought this was going to be the whole novel. But no, what happens is this obese woman shows up at Arturo's act. And she, she um, becomes mesmerized by him after he singles her out. In one, of, in one act and she comes back to him the next day and she, she tells her life story up to the point where she's got a pen pal in prison but because she, because she thinks he won't like her she keeps sending him basically pictures of cheerleaders and claiming that they're her and uh, she just feels that she's not comfortable in her own body and she basically is the pinpoint as to where the cult expands from uh, there's a doctor, basically. I can't, I can't remember what the doctor's name was, but this doctor pretty much works on behalf of Arturo. And once Arturo makes enough money in his act, he starts getting his own separate trailer, he starts getting his own separate employees and staff, and he hires this doctor. And the doctor basically starts taking limbs off people. And it all starts with this obese woman. She proclaims to start uh, following his act. It starts with taking fingers off and toes off, and then it builds and builds from there. And as repayment, the obese woman starts appearing in advertisements and flyers, basically asking people, or uh, not asking people, but um, advertising Arturo's cult. And it grows from there, up to the point where this cult, which follows the carnival around from state to state, the convoy for this cult is two miles long. There are thousands upon thousands of people who have become one with him who have given away their life savings and have decided to follow him around from state to state and it grows from fingers and toes to giving off their limbs to eventually but they become a head and a torso and are sent to retirement homes that are being built all around the country so it it slowly morphs into basically arturo as the villain of the piece and every other character is pretty much put to the wayside pretty much and it all centers around this cult and from there you meet some interesting characters, including one who I think is the pinnacle of, not the pinnacle, but the, rather the, the best part of the whole story. And his name is Vern, but he goes by the bag man. And this, I think, was the best short story in this novel, the best story out of the whole piece. It's the piece that I remember the most. So basically the bag man, or uh, Vern, uh, he's divorced, he's separated from his wife, he has two kids. And one day he comes to them while they're walking to school. He takes them and he goes on a little road trip with them, I think to Disneyland or something like that. And for a few days, you know, they have fun and all that sort of thing. And then when the kids start um, saying that they're a bit worried because they're going to miss out on things and they want to see their mother, 
he drives them back, but when he gets to the house, he leaves them in the car. And he goes around to the boot and pulls out a shotgun, a twin gauge shotgun or something like that. And the kids, I think, know what's going to happen and they're begging him to stop, but he pushes them out of the way and walks into the house. And the kids run next door and they're crying to the neighbours. And meanwhile, Vern goes, shoots the mother, she dies instantly. But then what happens is uh, as the kids are crying to the neighbours and the neighbours are calling for help, they hear a second shot and they go into the backyard and look over the fence and they see Vern's back. Then he turns around and all you can see is a bloody mess on his face. What he has done is he's, he's put the gun to his head, but he didn't kill himself. Rather, he took 75% of his face off. Everything was gone. His larynx, jaw, most of his mouth, his nose, his eye, his ear, his forehead. It's all gone. And the way it's described of him just standing there, stumbling around with red ooze dribbling everywhere, pussing everywhere. I'll never forget that. The, that whole t that whole story is ten pages, so it's quite a, it's quite a lot compacted into a short amount of time. But it's so well done, such a well written piece. Catherine Dunn is a good writer. I'm amazed that she doesn't have much doesn't have much other work. This is what she's best known for. Anyway, the bag man shows up to Arturo, and the way he communicates, he, you know, he's got a bag over his head and he's got one eye poking out. He communicates, you know, by writing down and passing notes off to him. And he ends up being an employee of Arturo and is sent to basically be the bodyguard of Ify and Elliot Simon's twins who have recently, um, once they've turned 18, have started selling themselves because they find out that there are people out there who will pay to ha pay good money to have sex with Siamese twins. And what it all builds and builds and builds from there pretty much. Uh, and it leads to, you know, incestual pregnancies and just all this disturbing stuff. It's a really uh, disturbing book. Uh, as I said before, the parents sort of, you know, they start off as a centerpiece, you know, and then they just fall by the wayside. And you get to certain pages in the book where you just forget they exist and then eventually they'll they'll make a passing remark and you're like oh shit yeah that's right that person that person existed and uh yeah that's pretty much just the basis of the book it's where the first half pretty much gives you this long long build up and this introduction of all the characters and all the plot lines going along and then the second half is focused on the cult and how that grows and envelops everything and then in that, you've got certain characters like the doctor, the obese woman, the bag man, and uh, a reporter who shows up. And it's, it, the way that's written into the book is great because this investigative reporter, will, um, who ends up working for the carnival, but he'll write his own separate pieces on them. At the end of most of the chapters in the latter half of the book, you'll find bits that are written by him. And it compresses what could be 20 pages of information into a couple of pages. So it's stuff like that that really breezes the book along. And it, it really makes it dense, but, re but very likable. I really like that style. So it's very well done. As for the present time, what happens with the, you know, the mother and the daughter and her daughter in the apartment block, I'm not going to say too much about that because it will spoil everything. Needless to say, I did prefer everything that happened in the pretty much the backstory then to this part. I think that was a lot more stronger. And the backstory with the whole carnival section of it, it ends literally with a bang. It's just this massive, just this build up and then explosion of family dynamics coming in and collapsing on one another. And I thought it should have ended there. That was a great place to end. It just, you just, you're reading through, flipping the pages and absolutely just in awe of what's going on. But then you realize there's still three chapters left. It, it doesn't end there. And I think it ends on a bit of a whimper, to be honest. I did not like the final three chapters that take place in the present time, even though you need them to finish the story off. So what she did basically did is, I think Catherine wrote herself into a corner with this. I just didn't, I did not, uh, maybe I just didn't appreciate as much as I should have. But I, yeah, I just found one portion of this story to be far greater than the other, even though they both need each other to coexist. Uh, so I'm not going to say too much about the present time. If, if this seems like the type of book based on what I've said, then yeah, go ahead and read it. Just be aware, aware that it's, you know, it's sick, disturbing. There's a lot of taboo stuff going on. It's unlike any other book I've ever read, uh, but above all, it's daring. 
And this was a National Book Award finalist, so there, it found an audience out there. It was optioned for a film. Tim Burton was going to make this. I don't think he could because it's just... I think this here, it, even for him, is way too twisted. If he was to do it, he'd do something along the lines of Big Fish. And even though Big Fish is a fine film, it's nothing like this. So I don't think Tim Burton could do it. Uh, other people who have uh, spoken highly of it are Chuck Palahniuk of Fight Club fame. He absolutely loves the book. Uh, the bassist from Red Hot Chili Peppers, surprisingly, as well. So it's got it's got its cult there. So it's a bit a bit funny how you know the book is is about a massive cult and it has a cult following. But as it stands, this here, my second read of the year, is one of the best reads of the last two years. Um, I love it. It's it's a fantastic book, absolutely fantastic, and. I don't think anything can take away from that. Everything that I've said to you is just the bare minimum because within each of these stories, even the story of the Bagman, there's just more and more going on. More and more subplots that coalesce with each other. And that's all I'm pretty much going to say. So yeah, if this sounds like your type of book, then go ahead and uh, read it. Otherwise, yeah, let me know what you think. Have a good day, everyone. See you.